Alright, you guys, welcome back to Little Man Big Conversations. Today's episode, I have the current owner of Impact Pro Wrestling, the longest running federation in all of Queensland Wrestling. Some might say the original federation of Queensland Wrestling. I'm delighted and I'm excited to have a big conversation with a big man with a bigger heart. Ladies and gentlemen, RIP. How are you, man? I'm good, man. How are you? Thanks for having me. Thank you for being a part of it, man. I know how busy it must be during this crazy time, being a family man, being a company owner, and trying to go through this crazy world right now. So I appreciate the time that you're able to give me. Yeah, it's really post-apocalyptic now, isn't it? It's crazy <laughs> out there. And I'm waiting for the I'm waiting for Mel Gibson to come riding down in that old black car of his and start shooting the shit. But as of right yeah. now, I, I ain't seen him anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Mel Gibson, classic. <laughs> now do you prefer <laughs> do you prefer your do you prefer your wrestling name or am I right to call you by a real name? Call me Josh. All right. RIP it is. No. Josh. <laughs> how do we know each other, man? Because I remember being there down at IPW and I remember you coming through with a bunch of other guys and getting your first training in that ring and coming through, I think it was on I think it was a weekend session and there was a bunch of you guys that had come in and, and used the ring and put on the show. And then shortly thereafter, you were signed up full time. You had the itch, you had the bug and you were there on one of the roster with no, in no time flat. Do you remember that first day for you? Yeah. Yep. So um, it was actually, I actually had a few personal sessions with um, Pete. Yeah. Uh, who later became, you know, my stepdad and all that. Um, yeah. Hawk. Okay. But, um, yeah, he. I actually saw him a bunch of times even before the weekend sessions. Okay. So, um, yeah, I, I think I did come on a Wednesday night with a group of people and a group, group of friends I grew up with and mm-hmm. we all got training. And I remember like during our lecture where, you know, we're talking about legal things like, oh, if you break your orbital bone, you know, <laughs> You know, that let's specific take bone. some precautions. Yeah, uh, but even during that talk, I uh, one of the wrestlers put me in a full Nelson and said, "This is what it feels like," <laughs> and um, it was really nerve wracking. But um, yeah. it was amazing. It was just an out of body experience, like the first time you do training. Yeah, it's a it's uh it's real surreal to watch that ring, to watch the guys in there. But it's a completely different experience to actually step through those ropes for the very first time. Now, do you mm-hmm. remember the first time? Speaking of first times, do you remember the first time that you and I got put in a storyline together? Because I certainly remember it, man. And I remember yeah. the photos that came out of that match. <laughs> I remember um, going over it with you to yeah. like just talking about the match and everything. And it was a training. And I think we we're like, oh, I'll, I'm a lot bigger. I'll, I'll throw you. And I remember one time I threw you and you went, from one corner of the ring to the other and then onto the floor. Do you remember that? Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. I, uh, uh, the survival mechanics definitely kicked in. I thought in midair, yeah, I'm going to, not sure where I'm going to land at this point. Yeah. I felt <laughs> so bad. I'm like, Oh wow. I didn't know I could do that. But, um, yeah, no, I had a lot of fun in our feud, man. Like the coffins and yeah, that damn the flaming coffin, coffins. Man. Yeah. That was, that was great, man. I remember, just before we did the coffin thing, um, my character at that point was heavily paying tribute to a lot of shows to a lot of the WWE soap stars from, from the current era to the past. And I remember before we did it, the, that coffin match, I remember I got my ass kicked by you and I had a bunch of uh, the young guys come out with, uh, I think it was like a first aid gurney, but it was one of those orange ones that looked like a canoe. Yep, and yep. I remember, <laughs> I remember awkwardly being put into what I, I had my eyes closed. I'm doing the cell. I'm, I'm in this, <laughs> I'm in this life raft canoe, <laughs> first aid thing, and I'm being carted out there. And man, it did feel like I was at a funeral. <laughs> yeah, oh, uh, so it was so hokey, wasn't it? It was really, <laughs> it was really hokey, like '70s, '80s sort of a storyline. And also, I set you on fire, and then you set me on fire. Was it the other way around? <laughs> Um, no, I think you have it right because I think, uh, yeah, there was something where, yeah, I think, I think you have it right the first way because I remember the second, I remember the match we did where I got the upper hand on you. We had a bunch of the young guys jump out of that coffin. We all threw you in there and I lit it with that one. Um, yeah, which was great. Like that was really fun. I remember that. Yeah. I think the only thing that 
I laughed about, I think, watching it back was, man, that coffin's like a clown car. So many dudes came out of that coffin. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and, and um, it also, it wasn't on stilts, so it was wood just lying on concrete. Mm. And so when I, when I got, I think I got drop kicked in the ass and I dove through the ropes. And yeah. um, when I came down, I didn't realize how low it was. So I just like okay. face planted into the ground and into the coffin, you know, and, um, and then I think the advice was, um, you know, when the smoke came, came into the coffin, you had like a wet rag to breathe in. Did you have that? Yeah. 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 yeah we, we either had the wet rag or we had, um, I think it was either the wet rag and the hole that was cut into the bottom of it to breathe. Which did shit all. <laughs> that <laughs> hole did nothing. I remember yeah. trying to use that hole and. Yeah, I don't know. It was like discovering the clitoris, really. Like it was just <laughs> impossible. But um, yeah, but it did exist. Yeah, it did exist. It's not a myth. But um, yeah. So that was intense. But I also remember um, with with the time I set you on fire because I think you got revenge, and that was the feud, and when you put me in there. But when mm-hmm. I put you in the coffin, I remember I I covered it in um, what did I cover it in? Just like, uh, I think it was either like some sort of spirits or some sort of lighter liquid. Yeah, yeah. And, and anyway, I I lit the thing, but the igniter wouldn't work. Mm. And then, and so I'm trying to get it to light. And I'm I, I don't even know if you know this, but like I was there for ages trying to light this thing. <laughs> and um, everyone was looking at me like, oh, this is a bit disappointing. And um, and then it does finally light, but it lights like a freaking one year old's birthday cake, you know, like a little <laughs> like a little flame in the middle of the the coffin. And I'm like, oh, for shit's sake! But yeah. the flame stayed there. But then it eventually, you know, started to light up. But people were already walking out, oh, so man. like you got set on fire. But most of the crowd were gone by the time you were completely, you know, yeah. engulfed in it. <laughs> yeah, we drowned him in spirits. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that was our first feud, man. Um, and I'm not sure if we ever got to cross paths again working together in the ring, uh, other than the occasional rumble and things like that. But we shared a locker room for many, many years, and recently we've been able to share a locker room again thanks to yourself and thanks to a lot of the guys putting their hand up going, hey, you should be back in that locker room again. So before we get into this, I really do appreciate you allowing me to come back and sit across in that locker room one more time and have some laughs and tell us some stories, man, because uh, I was gone for a long, long time, as you personally know, but it's hell, man. It's good to come home. So I appreciate you allowing me to come back in there. Oh, and, uh, mate, I got a lot of love for you. And um, I love having you in the dressing room. I love having you on the shows. It's just, and it's important. Um, like right now you're, you're with Chad Atlas and like, yeah, it's just really important because you lead by example, you know, like sure. you've been in the business for, we're going on almost 15 years, you know, and um, you've got to lead by example. These people look up to us and, like, we've got to be those mentors. And I know you're able to do that, mm-hmm. whereas um, some people don't wear it as a badge of honour, but um, it is. And we've got to mentor people and help them improve. Yeah. Because um, the, the one thing I hate in wrestling now is that someone comes back from the curtain and they're like, hey, how was my match? And no matter who you ask, they're like, oh, yeah, it was sweet as, man, and that's it. Like, yeah. There's, yeah. No matter what you do, there has to be room for improvement. And mm. um, that's what us, you know, guys who have been in the business a while need to be able to do is give a bit of constructive criticism so people can improve. Yeah, that's what um, it's all about, man. Yeah, for 100%. Because... Yeah, but pe- nowadays people don't want to hear that. So if we yeah. – if if enough of us actually, you know, start mentoring people, then maybe that can change, you know, the culture of it. Yeah. Um, Yeah. No, I've always felt like whenever I go out there and that's in that ring, whether it's with IPW, whether it's with any other federation I've worked for, it's always been a shoot to me. I, I, I feel what I feel. I say what I say because it all feels real to me. I am that guy in the stands with his glasses on crying, saying it's still real to me, damn it, because I don't, like fabricating emotions and I definitely don't like fabricating anything I do out there. If I get hit and it hurts, man, I'm going to let you know that it hurts. But the one thing I definitely a hundred percent agree with you on is the fact that people do need that crucial feedback because if it wasn't for guys like Hawk, it wasn't for guys like Cruz and and sweet ass and Ash and all the, and scorn and all the old school guys down there, man, I don't think, um, 
you or I would have been in the position that you or I have ended up in currently without that crucial feedback. Mm, because not only does it, it provide not only does it provide sincerity and, and improvement, but it also provides consistently and longevity in this business because it allows us to go, okay, yeah, I need to take a step back or hey, we should push this thing into overdrive. But there's always a level there of uh, respect and there's always a level there of consistency like, hey, I told you last time, you need to pull that back, you need to do that again or you should take that out of your system. Um, so yeah, I definitely 110% agree with you on the fact of, yes, there needs to be more feedback. The mentorship angle, I'm having a lot of fun with it. Hopefully we can pick it up again real soon given this crazy, crazy time that we're all in. But nonetheless, mm. I'm enjoying it down there. Chad has a good head on his shoulders. A lot of the new guys that I'm meeting, some some for not for a couple of years, some for the first time, all of them down there have a good head on their shoulders. But you're right, it's just about giving that important feedback. But that's how yeah. you and I know each other. We, we set each other on fire. We, we started in the same company together. I started in 2008. I'm hitting, pretty much hitting 12 years now in the biz. But take me back for you. Take me back to not the, not only the beginning of the career, but the beginning of Josh. Where were you and how did this all begin? Were you always a Queensland guy or did you travel around as a kid? No, no, always a Queensland guy. Um, yeah, no, always, always just uh, – I was born in uh, Sunnybank, I think it was. And then, um, yeah, I've always – Grown up in a little suburb called Algester. Um, we've had a property on Algester for about oh, it's going on sixty years. So wow, yeah, and um, you know, quite a lot of acreage and you know, lot, lots of bushland, which was great growing up. So um, yeah. yeah, I've always you know um, been an outdoorsy sort of type when I was a kid, and I think that's what got me into wrestling because I'm like, oh, I can wrestle people outside in my backyard and be a <laughs> be a yard tard and all that right, sort of right. stuff. But, um, yeah, then I discovered wrestling and I kind of, um, got into that. So you're an adventurous kid growing up. You like to get out there. Did you do camping, any mountain climbing? What was your no, activities no. as an outdoor kid? By outdoorsy, I mean, like someone saying to me, Hey, I dare you to run into a tree. And I'm like, okay. Um, <laughs> it was more like that. Uh, like I remember, uh, me and my brother, um, uh, jumping the fence in the horse paddock and then, um, pissing off the horse because the horse is always pissed off yeah. and waiting for it to charge us. And the last person in, in the, um, pen wins. Okay. So, you know, that sort of that sh silly shit outside, you know, like, um, I think, um, I don't know. I think that's the way to be when you're a kid is, you know, um, get outside, get outside and, you know, adventure around a little bit and yeah. Mm. Do you feel like kids today don't do that too much? They're all sort of on the phone, on the social medias, on the videos. It's not yeah, the I iPad. Yeah, my yeah. kids are shocking. They're, you know, they're already, you know, taught in school and stuff to be glued to iPads and all that mm. sort of stuff. But look, I'll give them credit. They do go outside a fair bit. So, um, with yeah, the they, iPad. <laughs> yeah, with the iPad. Yeah, just to get some fresh air. Yeah. Look at this tree on my iPad. There's one right yeah. there. Watch Daddy run into it. Um, yeah. So you're an out you're an outdoorsy kid, um, but for those that don't know, you're actually a tall kind of guy. You're uh, how, how tall are you? I am six foot four and a half. Wow. And people okay. always say like, "Oh, you should be a basketball player," and right. then I, I I then proceed to tell them to go fuck themselves because <laughs> um, I've got bad knees. Always have had bad knees. Before yeah. I even started wrestling, I already had one knee that would constantly pop out and. Wow. I tore a few muscles and all that, but, um, with, with being tall, people are like, you should play basketball. And I'm like, mate, I can't jump. Just leave me alone. Like, stop talking about basketball. All right. So you've spun the ball in the middle finger. That's your, uh, <laughs> that's your feeling with basketball. You've yes. gone through schooling. So now you're at the end of school. Was this around the time that wrestling became in, that came into your life? Were you shown it during adolescence or did it come after? When, when would wrestling play a, a role in your life and how old were you when that happened? My brother and I were watching TV one day. I was 12, maybe 11, mm -hmm. and we're watching a match. Uh, I think it was Edge and Triple H were wrestling and um, the referee gets taken down. Okay. And at the time, I thought that was hilarious that the referee <laughs> just got knocked out. Yeah. Because I'm just like, like I'm used to watching bloopers where, you know, 
a boxer accidentally boxes out the referee and it's like, oh my God. So I thought, what the hell? Like, this is mm. hilarious. Yeah. And then all these antics ensued after the ref was down. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this is crazy. And so I got into it. I love Triple H growing up. I, he's still okay. my hero. He's, he's a great wrestler. But um, yeah, I, I really got into it. And then at about um, 13, I met a lot of other people that were into wrestling. And so we got into that. And before that I was more into comedy, like theatrics. Like I went to um, a drama school and I got into a school that was called um, the school of excellence. So it was going to, it was going to head to performing arts stuff and, Mm -hmm. you know, um, all sorts of different avenues, but I ended up turning it down because I also discovered IPW. So, right. um, was it still when got, you were 13 or was this at a later age now? No, no, this was, this was when I was 16. I had the ultimatum where, or 15, okay. where I had yep. to make the decision to, to choose. And, um, yeah, I had to make that tough decision and, um, I'm glad I made, um, the decision to join IPW because, you know, I wouldn't have met my, my love, beautiful wife and, you know, I wouldn't have these two kids and I wouldn't have the friends I have in wrestling, you know, like, yeah. um, it's definitely the best decision of my life. So it was a choice between acting and wrestling for you at that point at, at 15, 16. Yes. And, uh, where, how far along were you with acting that, that, that made it such a, a tough decision? Were you really passionate about going down the acting field and you went, Hey, I'm really, I can't get this wrestling thing out of my mind. Is that, what was making that decision hard for you at that point? Yeah, well, basically it was a five-day-a-week thing, this okay. school that they wanted me to go to. And um, it would also mean going into state and doing plays. And and I, I had done stand-up before as well at 15, and it actually was really awesome. I did really well at it. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, I guess they gave me that opportunity. And then b- – by the time came, I just saw this IPW and I was just like, I've got to do it, you know, like, and, um, it was very impulsive and I didn't know anything about it. And, um, but I just did it. Something just called me to it, you know? Yeah. So you just had that, you you had that, uh, proverbial itch that, that needed to be scratched and wrestling was the cure. Yep. That's it. All right. So you've decided with a heavy heart, because you're really passionate about acting, but you thought, hey, I'm going to give this wrestling thing a go and see where it leads me. Where do you go from there? Is it straight to IPW? Do you have a little bit of trials and tribulations with the wrestling before getting into that ring? What was the wrestling journey for like for you at 16? Um, So I actually contacted another company at the time um, to join as well. Uh, They were in Brisbane. Okay. Um, Because I I followed IPW and I also followed this other company and – yeah, I was uh, just really wanting to learn as much as I can. So I was willing to train at two places and all that sort of stuff. But um, then I just um, became, when I had my first lesson, I guess I kind of bonded with the trainer, which was, you know, Pete. Sure. And yeah. um, I guess I formed a, an emotional attachment pretty much instantly mm-hmm. where um, I didn't feel the need to go anywhere else. So, um, and also, a lot of people don't realize that um, um, with with training, it was I think it was three nights a week. Yeah. And um, yeah, I, I think you trained all three nights at the start, didn't you? With yeah. Blaze and Fury. Yeah, man. We um, there was a period of time there. I think it was it before that. It was I think he was deciding whether it was going to be three or four nights. Some, I, I remember some, some weeks being four. We had yeah. the show Saturday, Sunday was off, and then it was pretty much Monday to Thursday, had Friday off, Saturday show, Sunday, again, rinse and repeat. I think eventually either the turnout wasn't good on Thursday or it was just decided that it may be life circumstances changed, whatever it was, but there was a decision made unbeknownst to – us around there of what the real reasons were, but there was a decision made to, Hey, we're going to bring it back to three. And I think it, I think everyone was like, Oh yes, please. <laughs> we would yeah. like two days off before the show. Um, yeah. but yes, I remember those sessions and I think I remember coming in for one of those sessions. I think it was a Wednesday and I think you were just wrapping up your one-on-one session with Hawk because I hadn't seen you before. 
And I remember yeah. you, you walking out as we were walking in and that was like, oh, is this guy joining up? And, you know, Pete sort of, no, Sultan was like, oh, well, maybe. And we, to us, it was like, okay, but of course, unbeknownst to any of us, you had already signed up. You were already yeah, training. Yeah, I'd, I'd already well and truly signed up, yeah. Yeah, but he, he gave us the no-sell. He was, a you know, as you know firsthand, and a lot of us that are listening for this know, as Pete and oftentimes was a man of mystery, and he would uh, either work the sell or he would no-sell it. It was, a, it was yeah. a two-way street. But if he sold you on something, man, he made you believe it to the nth degree. And that was what he was doing with us. He was sort of saying, ah, we'll wait and see. And sure enough – Lo and behold, I think maybe even close to maybe a month at, at most, uh, you were starting to do those shows there in uh, in Ashmore. So mm -hmm. at this point, you've signed up. You're getting a few matches under your belt. How are you feeling now, stepping from doing training, stepping into that ring? What was it like that first time you stood in that ring and, and started training? Were you confident about it? Were you happy to be in there? Or was this a, oh, man, this is going to be a sink or swim moment for sure right here? How were you feeling? Um. I was overwhelmed. Like, um, mm -hmm. I'm not good at multitasking. I'm a male, so I'm not good at multitasking. <laughs> but yeah. um, with with holds and learning the transition and everything, it takes an open mind and you need complete concentration. So that was tough. Um, and so I ended up with, with those three nights of training, going to all three of those sessions. But then um, I started contacting um, Pete and asking him, if I could go more. So, um, I ended up training five nights a week for probably three, four months. And, um, so, uh, those five nights, um, my mum actually got to spend, you know, a bit of time with Pete and they started to, you know, develop feelings for each other. So okay. I inherently, inherently became, um, third wheel to that sort of <laughs> bond that, that yeah. was created. So, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, so that happened, and um, so it was really hard to because it was confusing. I'm like, he's my wrestling trainer, dude. Like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. But um, that happened, so that was tough training and having that because um, I guess this is why I relate to Triple H. You know, like he he got with the boss's daughter, he got treated differently. Yeah. Um, even though he's a dick, and I'm a dick too. I'm sure he's a dick, but um, yeah, that's just you know how it is and it was an awkward situation and I think he felt the same way with Stephanie maybe mm -hmm. I don't know but um so I relate to that and um I remember you know some of the guys asking me oh is that a thing or whatever and I'm I'm just like wait dude just back off and yeah. so look that did hinder my wrestling experience um oh it did as a rookie yeah it actually um I ended up getting really frustrated and um I was never a hot-headed person I, I don't think anyone really saw me get hot headed at that age. I don't think anyone ever saw me get hot headed until I started writing a company, but, um, yeah. yeah, I, I remember going off at Pete and his office telling him, you know, what the hell are you doing? You're favoring me over the guys and blah, really? blah, blah. You yeah. Had yeah. We, we had him. a big, a big, uh, screaming match. And, wow. um, was that at training one session when everyone had gone or was this during your one-on-one -on -one session? Was, yeah. Saturday morning training. So, um, and look, I honestly didn't give a shit because Saturday morning, um, yeah, th they were all really intense in, in training mode. So I was just in his office, just, um, mm -hmm. yeah, going off at him and which I shouldn't have done. And, uh, but he really appreciated it. That's what I, yeah. I thought was really cool of Pete where mm -hmm. he completely understood where I was coming from. He realized he was at fault, but not at fault at the same time. You know, he's mm -hmm. a human being, he has feelings. Sure. Um, so wrestling was hard then. Um, it's probably the hardest time I ever had in wrestling. Um, and I just kept to myself with the guys. And then my friends ended up bailing on wrestling, so they didn't stick around. Yeah. And so I was kind of like, have I made this horrible decision? Mm. Mm. And um, I, I'm training hard and I'm like, am, I'm, am I even getting anywhere? And then I um, got offered to go to Warwick to do a bunch of radio interviews with Pete yeah. and I'm like, well, I'm a nobody. Why do you want me to do interviews? And he's like, well, become your character. And he gave me the character of RIP, mm -hmm. which I hated and I still hate. <laughs> really? Um, 
Yeah, I hate I hate the character. I still have the character, um, and that is completely out of respect for Pete. I will never change my character name because he gave me that, and I consider it a, a birthright, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, with the name, I just thought it was so corny. Like Undertaker says that every week. Why am I doing this? You know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I had this gimmick, and um, so he wanted me to work on being mean, which I wasn't good at at the time. Mm-hmm. And um, him taking me to Warwick, um, I think we went every two weeks for a little while to promote a show that he was going to do there. And um, after getting a bit used to that, he decided to give me a match. Right. And on the night of the match, I wrestled a guy called Peter O, and he was um, right. a rookie himself. Um, and anyway, we had our match, and it was it was just moves, you know, like every everyone's first match is god awful. But um, mm-hmm. there was no botches. The moves looked fine, but it was just moves. There was no storytelling. Um, was this your debut it, match or was this just a match that you had to do up there? No, no, this is the debut match. And um, yeah, So you debuted at that Warwick show? No, no. I Sorry, this is the show before the Warwick show. Right. Okay. So yeah. before the Warwick show. Yeah. Yeah. And anyway, so we do that show. Um, and I believe there was a guy on our roster who actually – Um, bootlegged the footage that we filmed for that show and kept it for himself. Funny thing about that, though, is I was actually over the moon that he screwed us over and was claiming the footage for himself because it was actually going online and I got to watch my match, you know? Yeah. But, yeah, um, yeah, so there was a bit of controversy and so my match never really got um, much attention and um, then it came to the Warwick show, which was – which was really fun. I had a lot of fun. Um, do, do you remember when Pete went off at us out the front? Were you there for that? Um, it doesn't ring a bell. Maybe if you start telling the story, it might chime some memories. But no, I don't remember. So so we're at this Warwick show and we're mm-hmm. all standing out the front uh, waiting to get into the venue. And um, it's a ghost town. You know what Warwick's like. Yeah. But, um, yeah, so we're waiting, and I'm really nervous. All the rookies are really nervous. And um, Pete pulls up, and he starts going off at us, calling us every name under the sun. And I'm just like, what's this guy's problem? Like, what have we done wrong? And I find out that it's because, you know, all these guys with different characters and, you know, because of kayfabe and all that, we're out the front mingling with each other, which didn't look professional. And he's completely right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that – added to the pressure of this Warwick show. Then um, we get the door numbers for the show and it's a complete disaster. There's, there's only 30 people in the crowd the first night. Mm-hmm. Again, it's a disaster. Um, then the people we've got working in the canteen, they're, um, they're overcharging with food and also serving the food cold, like cold sausages and bread. It was horrible. Anyway, all wow. these things went wrong. And yeah. um, I really started to sympathize with Pete because he was really struggling. He was losing money. Um, he had tears in his eyes because, you know, he, he put so much work into this. Mm. And so I thought to myself, um, you know, like I really want to make him proud tonight. So at least he got something out of it. Sure. Yeah. And um, anyway, he put me on the main show because even though I was a rookie, because we had a rookie show and a main show. And um, <laughs> even though I was a rookie, he, he wanted the big guys on there. So me and Peter O do this no disqualification match, um, which we shouldn't have been doing because we're so green. Um, But we, we traded chair shots and it was so reckless. Like we were just hitting each other really hard, but you know what? The crowd were really into it. Mm -hmm. And um, the, the hillbilly nature of Warwick were like really, (laughs) really keen. And um, that, that won Pete over. And so after the match, um, that's when I felt like a real wrestler. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I became a wrestler because like after the match, he was so happy that, um, at least I beat the hell out of someone. I was a bit of a monster, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was just, it was crazy. And then he, he grabs, uh, Chris Saxon, who we all know Saxon. He's infamous in wrestling. Mm-hmm. Lovely guy. Got a lot of, lot of love for Saxon. Yeah, but, um, he, he grabs him and says, look, I know he's young, but take him out and get him pissed. And um, <laughs> he paired me up with Saxon. And 
the thing is you don't ask Saxon to get someone pissed because his idea of getting pissed is sitting on a balcony and just drinking all night and listening Mm -hmm. to him. And so that's what my (laughs) night was, was just listening to his crazy stories all night. And I loved it though. I felt like one of the boys Mm -hmm. and, um, that was the first time I felt that. So that's when I, I think I became a wrestler was that, that weekend where I got yeah. to spend it with all the guys. We got to walk around town. We got to sign autographs and yeah. Yeah. That, that was a, a real um, experience for me. Man, the, the one thing I, I take away from, from that show is uh, yeah, definitely the, the drive getting up there. That was a long drive, but that, I remember that venue being, really unique and really had this sort of uh i guess you would call like a vintage vibe to it like it was just very like a very different kind of sensation just walking into that that building you could feel the history in that building like as soon as you walked in it was it was just designed differently you know like some old heritage style buildings today have that same vibe like you know the queen victoria buildings and like you know you just and some of the old queensland houses that you see around and i guess any anyone listening out there in their individual uh states on their countries you have those sort of old looking buildings and you just think man these aren't they, they, they don't make buildings like this anymore. So I remember walking in and feeling real intimidated with that venue because it was like, man, we have to really step it up here because this building has some history to it. And not just from a wrestling standpoint, from just an everyday life standpoint. You could just tell that some really influential people in our in our nation's history had come through that building at one stage or another. But mm. I remember the one thing too is after we did that show – I think I ended up refereeing for an entire show because something happened with one of the referees. And I was like, I put my hand up and said, man, I'll, I'll do it. Um, and I remember Pete being real grateful for that. He was like, okay, thanks. You know, that was something mm-hmm. that just needed to be done. And I was like, screw it. I don't care. Um, but I remember the one thing about Saxon is, yes, I remember him. I could, I could consistently remember his voice booming away for majority of the night. And then mm. I remember at one point it went silent. And then at a very early in the morning, there was the sound of a drain pipe being hit. And I thought, what the hell? Where are we? Where are we staying? What is happening right now? And in the morning, we all had woken up. We were all feeling pretty good. I think it was a two-day show. I think we had one the next day. Uh, yeah. could, be, could be wrong, but I, I remember. No, no, that's right. So we had the show the next day. All of us were there, but we were looking around for Saxon. Man, where the hell is Saxon? What happened to him last night? You had said, "Oh man, we we were drinking last night." But uh, you said you said you called it in early, and Saxon kept going, and eventually he turned up to the venue, and it came out that that drain pipe noise that I heard that early in the morning, probably about four or five in the morning, was Saxon coming back from wherever the hell he went to, climbing up the drain pipe because the building was locked. So he climbed the oh, drain pipe to get kidding. back in. Did he really? Yeah, that's the story I got told, man. I don't know whether it's true. I, I believe it, hundred percent. I've got to find. I've got to track that man down and ask him one day. But that's the story I was told, and to this day, I still believe it. That a drunk Saxon climbed the drain pipe to get back into his unit because he lost. He forgot how to get into it. That's there's something crazy about Warwick. Did you hear about Crazy Eddie? I don't know if you remember Crazy Eddie. He had he had one eye. Was he the driver? Yeah. Yeah, I remember the I remember the driver, but. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So I, crazy Eddie, he, the, the night before, not many people know this, but like, um, I was already, you know, um, even living with Pete at the time. So like, we're getting all these calls like, Oh, this is going wrong. This is going wrong for this show. And we get a call and, um, Eddie's on the phone. He's like, Oh, I may have smoked too much and backed the truck <laughs> off, off of, uh, the mountain on the way up to um where on the way up to tamp not tambourine where are we toowoomba you know the mountain you drive up to toowoomba yeah well he had backed his truck somehow he had got his the end of his truck off that mountain and he was completely cooked so (laughs) crazy eddie was trying to you know fix the truck so he had to end up getting that towed towed out of off the mountain and um it's just everything that went wrong did. Um, and yeah, it's just so many things happened with Warwick where, you know, it was just like an omen. But um, at the end of the day, like I'm, I'm glad we wasted all that money. 
<laughs> even though it wasn't mine to waste <laughs> because it was just an, a fun experience. Man, that's the beauty of wrestling, man. Sometimes you just got to experiment and see what happens. Yeah. All right, so we did the Warwick show and we head back down, back down to IPW. Then we, I think it was shortly thereafter that, as we mentioned before, you and I did that feud, and mm-hmm. it wasn't too long after, wasn't too long after that that uh, we changed venues. We moved from the training facility and we started at the same venue you guys are at now. At IPW every month comes out of William Duncan State School Hall in the Rang. Once a month they put on shows there. You guys start gaining a crowd there. The school pays attention. The family and the kids come down for a night of entertainment. But it wasn't too long after that. We're about 2013. I had actually left that company. And it was, I at that point had pretty much next to no contact with a lot of the people down there. I'd still kept in contact with like a handful of guys, but I wasn't seeing the faces I always saw. I wasn't going to the place that I always knew and I wasn't training in a facility that I felt comfortable with. So I knew at that point, man, this is, this is, this felt strange. So I left that company but it wasn't long after that, I think maybe two or so years later, that word comes down that you were now not only leading the, the locker room to a certain extent, but you had been given the power of the entire company. Because I wasn't there, and for those listening, how did we go from lighting each other on fire to a <laughs> few years later, you now being in control of a company that when you started, you felt uncomfortable with the owner even just sort of hanging out with your mom. But now, yeah. now the owner is, hey, do you want this company? Talk me through that Talk me through that process. How did this all come about? And what the hell were you thinking when it was positioned to you? Um, Pete and I, I um, fell in love. I'll tell you that. We... Yeah. Um, he became a father to me, like literally. Yeah. And, uh, you know, my mum got married and um, you were at the wedding, weren't you? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, you I were. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm positive you were. No, I was um, because I remember him saying to me after the reception, I I remember this. I told him the story, I think, I think a week later, that I had gone to the kids section of the clothing department and I had bought myself – what I felt was a tailor-made suit, but it wasn't a tailor-made suit. It was a kid's tuxedo ensemble, some blazer and tuxedo pants, nice shirt, all wrapped up in one little parcel. It was designed for about a 13-year-old, and I have the height of about a 13, 14-year-old. So there I am in what seemingly getting a very nicely altered tailor suit, which I thought it was, and I remember wearing it to that wedding. Just I bought it just for that wedding, and I remember – I remember Hawk, aka Pete, saying to me after the after the reception, "Jesus, you scrub up, all right." So, oh. <laughs> and I said, "Yeah." I, I said, "I got I got this tailor made." And he goes, "Yeah, I can I can tell." And then a week later, I told him it wasn't tailor made. It was a kid. <laughs> it was he a does kid. have a strange taste in clothes, though. I will say, yeah. whether it's you know wearing g strings or wearing <laughs> tie dye, and he wear a bandana in his head to look like a pirate, and um. Hey, is that the Pete, Pete was crazy <laughs> but like they got married yeah um, they got married yeah yeah they got married uh pete pete rang me um because you know i'd moved from home and ended up starting a family of my own mm-hmm. and um pete rang me and said look um i'd like you to come down to training i, I just need help you know we've got an influx of rookies and um yeah he he was um needing help. And so I, I came down to training, um, and not to, not to be a student now, it was to train people. And then I became like the head trainer there. And, um, I, Pete, Pete liked how I was, I, th- I think a bit firmer. I had to kind of demand control of the guys just so, you know, they'd learn. And, uh, I think you need that in, tr- in wrestling training, you need uh, a voice of reason and, somewhere to keep you in check. And anyway, so Pete, um, Pete really appreciated me doing all that. And he also saw that, um, whether, uh, you know, one of the guy's girlfriends was sleeping around and there was an issue backstage and they're all mm. arguing with each other or whatever it was, Pete appreciated that I was able to diffuse the situations. And, yeah. um, another thing was like, um, we had one guy 
um, he got told his match was bad and it was, it was awful. Okay. And he lost his temper. He didn't like the criticism and uh, he lost his temper and um, swore at my mother, called her the C word, all these sorts of horrible things. And Pete looked around and no one did anything. You know, none of the guys did anything because they didn't know what to do. They freaked yeah. out. Yeah. And I think Pete, cause he saw me shoot up and go to grab the guy. And then I got held back mm. and this guy gets escorted off the, off the place and he's still carrying on in the car park. And I think he saw that, you know, I was first to, to get in there and uh, defend our company, defend the family and all of that. And I think he just started to really acknowledge it. And yeah. we did become really close. Um, we've always been close, but there was also, you know, um, I still had to look at him as a trainer a lot of the time. And I'd get really frustrated because he was getting older and, you know, forgetting things. And, and so sometimes training was a bit crazy and I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. Mm, but, yeah. um, yeah, so we had a lot of arguments, but I, th I think again, he appreciated that I was at least speaking my mind with him. And I know you had that relationship with him too, where yeah. you need to be able to address things with him and he wouldn't talk to you for weeks months, oh. whatever, but, mm. but he would respect that you have at least spoke your mind, you know? Yeah. It was a process with Hulk. He, he did develop, um, an, an eventual sort of overall, um, father figure role with a lot of the talent down there. A lot of the talent felt like they could go and talk to him about things outside of what was happening in the ring. Um, mm. but yeah, I, not to the same extent um, that you developed the relationship with him because it was um, obviously involved a, from a family aspect. But, yeah, I, I had a similar relationship that you've referenced with him where um, there were times during <clears throat> my early career down there where things going on in everyday life were starting to affect my in-ring life. And I could feel myself not performing to my best but pretending – like I was performing to my to my best, and he had a very mm. he had a very sharp eye for people when they were people when they're on the ball and people when they weren't on their ball. And mm. I remember one time we finished the show, and it was it was a show at the training the training school, and we're packing up, and then he stuck his head in and he said, you know, flash, and I went, yeah, and he goes, come here, and went into that that side office he had. And he sat down and he's like, you have to tell me what's going on right now. And I went, mm. well, and I you know, was instantly defensive because I hadn't, I think it was the first time that I had a conversation like this with him. And I went, well, mm. what do you mean? And he goes, what was that out there? And I went, oh, yeah, I, I, I think I've just forgot a few moves and I just got, I, I was just going too fast. You know, I'm really sorry. And he goes, no, no. He goes, I don't care about that match. He goes, what was going on there? He goes, because I could tell watching that. You weren't there. Mm. You you went into it. And he goes, so I need to know what's going on right now. And I was, you know, admittedly, and I admit this to you, and I, I put this live on audio, I wasn't in a position to speak about what I was going through. So I became really defensive with him. I became hostile. I was like, I don't want to talk about it. This, uh, this is, you know, I just want to train. Who are you? Like, because, because I wasn't dealing with what I was going through and I was pretending and telling everyone that I was okay for someone then to question, Hey man, I can tell you're not okay mm. because I was, you know, emotionally immature at that point. And, and we all go through those stages in adolescence growing up where you're just mm. not in, in, in charge of your emotions. And when you're not in charge of your emotions, anyone that questions how in charge you think you are, even though you're not, you will act defensively on it. And that's what happened. I went, oh, you know, who are you to, yeah, blah, blah, this is, this is weird. Blah. And uh, yeah, similar thing for about a, for about a week there. Um, it was a bit of a cold short, a bit of an awkward vibe. It wasn't as, it was friendly, but you could tell that something had happened. Like, you know, we weren't sort of on the same level. Um, and yeah, eventually... I think I came to him and probably wasn't even a week, probably it was about three days. Um, and I just came to him and I just apologized. And he said, he, he, he got it. He goes, I, look, mate, he goes, I get it. Trust me, I've had worse fights than you can imagine, but what's going on? And I explained to him my issues at that time. And straight away, without question, he's like, I get it. He's like, you, 
need to be able to do this, this, and this because if you don't, he goes, I've been there, and if you don't do that, you are not going to enjoy your time here. And if you're not enjoying your time here, then I don't think it is right to have you continue here because you are not mm. taking care of yourself. He goes, I can't reward you by putting you in that ring if you are not at home taking care of yourself. Mm. And I went, I went, yeah, that's completely valid. So it mm. wasn't so much a – it wasn't a blackmail. It was coming from a position of, hey, man, you need to take care of yourself because – it was basically like, hey, man, if you don't take care of yourself, you're going to hurt yourself in that ring, and then you're going to be effed up two ways from Sunday. You're going to be hurt physically. You're going to be hurt emotionally and mentally as you are now, and you're not going to be in a good place. So he was real good with me from that Check aspect. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. You know? Yeah, like, man. It's yeah. like that. Exactly, yeah. man. And uh, no, he was – that kind of spurred everything on from there, um, and – yeah, he had a real father figure approach with all of us, man. But mm. yeah, so uh, yeah, you you were able to go and chat to him about certain things. Um, yeah, the we'll scream at him. We'll because I think watching him, it's a, it's not in my blood to be a hot headed person. Sure, I'm yeah. not. Never, never as a kid was I one to get angry much. And but then I learned watching him <laughs> and like <laughs> okay. watching him set up the ring and call it every name under the sun when a bolt was stripped and we couldn't get it out or um, all that sort of stuff. It was a learned behavior of me seeing that. And, and then I started to lose my temper quicker. And, and, and so two hot heads in a room, you know, it's gonna, um, it's, it's gonna erupt. And I think he was happy that he had someone to bicker with, you know? And so we were just like two grumpy old men. And um, Good movie. anyway, Hey, Good movie. Oh, I love Walter Mathar, man. Walter Mathar and uh, what's the other guy's name? Jack Lemon, I think. Jack Lemon, that's it. Anyway, um, yeah, so we did all that, and um, he he was ready to give it up. Give it up. He he didn't appreciate. We had a few douchebag trainees. So I'll, I'll give him credit. Like they were they were quite up to themselves and not taking criticism. And I think he felt the shift in attitude with, you know, the younger people coming in mm -hmm. and he didn't appreciate it. And he didn't know how to get through to them because he just didn't relate to them. And of course, you know, being younger, I, I did, and I had a way of talking to them and yeah. they, I was getting results. Um, and I think also he had just given so much money and time and he honestly, like people don't know this about Pete, but he gave a lot to charity. He, he was all about, um, like one time he lost all this money at a, a show we did in the church mm -hmm. and all he had was the fee, uh, for having the show. So I think it was $900 yeah. and then, um, he had no other profit. And, um, so he did lose money even with that $900. Uh, one lady was talking on the microphone and said that, you know, her kid had cancer and blah, blah, blah. Immediately, he got up and gave that person nine hundred dollars. Wow! You know? yeah. yeah, and that's Pete, and he did it discreetly. He, he did it respectfully, and um, I was pissed at him for doing that because I knew he was struggling with money, mm -hmm. but he still did it because you know there's people worse off than him, and I think um, Pete really didn't get credit for you know the, the good things he did with charity and all that, but um, it was all getting too much. The, the money in wrestling and um, he, dealing with the egos and adapting to the new style of wrestling too. Yeah. Cause he's very old fashioned. And um, I honestly prefer Pete's way of looking at a match and the psychology of it all, where it was all mm -hmm. psychology, mm -hmm. but we've got to adapt with the times. And um, one day he came over and he said, you know, look, I want to give it up. It's done. Mm. And I'm like, oh, please don't. This is, you know, my life and so many other people's lives. Like, you can't do this. And then he left and it broke my heart. And then um, he comes and visits me again. And um, he just says, I want you to run it. So he went home and thought about it, come back. He's like, look, I want you to run it. You can do it. Yep. Um, I'll, I'll mentor you. I'll help you. He, You know, he just gave me it. He gave mm. me the business. He gave me the ring. Um, and I, I kind of offered money and all these sorts of things. But he just said, you know, you've already earned it. Mm. Because um, there was a time where uh, 
we would go and do maintenance on the ring and do that all day and I would have nothing to gain from it, but I just wanted to do it because being around that sort of stuff is knowledge in wrestling, you know, and yeah. um, all that, all that work. And also listening to him, I think he knew that I listened to him struggle and that I listened to him go for all these hard times. And um, I think he knew that um, I cared. So yeah. Um, he just said, you've already earned it. And so he helped me and everything um, started up. And look, there was a resentment too, because when I took over, it went completely different. I, I improved all the lighting and stuff like that. Um, yeah. But I still had to win over the locker room as the, the new owner. Yeah. Which I didn't, I didn't face any controversy. I think everyone was really happy that I took over, but you still got to win people over as the boss. I'm not the friend anymore, you know? Sure. And, um, yeah, anyway, so there was a bit of resentment from Pete. And so one day he'd be really happy I've accomplished all these things in wrestling. And then the next day he'd change his mind and be, be a bit shitty with me or whatever. But that was just, for me, for Pete, that was like losing, losing something, you know, like having his heart broken because wrestling was his baby, you know? Yeah, and, it's almost um, like a grieving transition like he knew it was the right thing to do but he was still grieving because of like how long he had created and kept that so it was almost like a grieving process for him yeah well he he rang me one morning and he's like i hear you're having trouble getting the ring to the show tonight and i'm like yeah yeah i i, I really am and he's like um I'll, I'll drive the ring down for you i'll drive it on the trailer for you and i said mm -hmm. oh are you sure do you really want to do that you don't have to do that pete and he says, oh, fine, go fuck yourself and hangs up the phone. Oh, wow. Um, and then he doesn't talk to me for a few days and I had to figure it out myself. But, like, his, his grieving process would change so quickly. You know, mm -hmm. one minute he wants to help, the next minute he was, he was bitter about it. Yeah. But in the end, he, he um, really started to see what I was doing and um, he really um, – he also started to appreciate Taryn a lot more too. My wife, yep. she, she, um, is, is just incredible with managing all these things. And, um, especially with, like with financing and organizing people to, to work certain things and editing, like she had to do a lot of our posters at first cause we didn't have a, someone to make our posters and yep. she, she just learned all that stuff from scratch, similar to what you did when you were with us. You just, yeah. you just yeah. taught yourself these things mm -hmm. and um, it, she was just amazing. And so he really appreciated her too. And um, yeah, that's how I really it transitioned over to me. And the one thing that I really love now is that my kids are now in the position that I was in where they're growing up around all these wrestlers and they're, they're in the business, you know, and they look forward to going to the wrestling every month. And, um, mm. they, they watch me train twice a week and all this sort of stuff. And, um, it's kind of come full circle. You know what I mean? Yep. Well, uh, Which is really said, nice. When you said you're in the, they're in the position that you were in as a kid. I'm like, what? Don't tell me they're running off into trees. No, no, no. I'm not throwing him into trees. No, not yet. This is what They're dad did. <laughs> yeah. As long as I don't get him to juice afterwards, that's that's the main thing. <laughs> Make it in this business. <laughs> yeah. All right, you guys, we're going to hit the pause button right there. I know. <laughs> I know. It's on a good part. I'm sorry about that. But hey, don't fret. Part two is coming out very soon. So if you haven't already, please follow Little Man Big Conversations podcast on all the social medias at LMBC podcast on Facebook and Instagram and at LMBC underscore podcast on Twitter. Thank you all for listening so much and I'll see you next week. <laughs>